dragons and ghostly skeletons, you are a Styanex, warrior of Rivia, on a treacherous journey to rescue Princess Rosebud from the evil wizard Blackhorn. Fight the forces of darkness with three magical spells, fueled by five mystical power sources. Master three special weapons through 12 exciting levels of play. A Styanex for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Live action that never ends. As a child of the 80s, my brothers and I were quite fortunate to have grown up with the NES. Of course, we had a few games at the time, such as Super Mario, Duck Hunt, Legend of Zelda, and Iron Sword. Yes, the game with romance novel model Fabio on the cover. Don't judge, it was actually a good game. Beauty has a face, perfection a name. Because the games were bought by our parents, they were understood to belong to all of us and were otherwise shared equally. And there was absolutely nothing wrong with that because, for the most part, we loved to watch each other play just as much as actually playing the games ourselves. However, I remember quite fondly when I turned 8 that the one thing I asked my parents for on my birthday was a video game. A game that I could call my own. My parents, being the wonderful people they are, I love you mom and dad, took me down to the Kmart and told me to pick a game. I remember being overwhelmed with the decision as I plastered my face against the glass case. What would I choose? What game would I finally call my very own, my very first video game? Would I get Batman? Forget the Arkham Dark Knight. <coughs> We're talking the Purple Caped Crusader. <coughs> or maybe even Adventures of Lolo 2. Or Final Fantasy, which at the time I did not know a lot about. I mean, it was the first game in what would be a multi-billion dollar franchise, and Harold is one of the greatest RPG series of all time. How was I supposed to know? I was only eight, get off my back! I mean, they were all great picks. But no, I would choose none of these. My eyes were drawn to something else entirely. Asted, as, as, er, has snacks? Has an axe. Has the axe. God bless you. How could I not pick up this game? Just look at the cover. There's a damsel in distress, a looming dragon dead center, and a kid with a sword about to slay the dragon. I mean, this kid's literally grabbing the dragon's claw like, get back dragon, I'm a fax. This kid was the epitome of cool, and so I had my first very own video game. And boy was it weird. I mean the cover really did not reflect the game at all. The main character actually had brown hair rather than blonde. The dragon looked completely different. How did the artist go from this in the game to this on the cover? Sounds like false advertising, right? Beyond the cover artist's interpretation of the game, there was actually a reason for some of the incongruencies between the cover, the cutscenes in the game, and the game itself. But before we get to that, let's learn a little bit more about the main character, shall we? This is Astyanax. Wait a minute. Okay. This is Astyanax. What? No. What's going on here? Astyanax is a genus of freshwater fish in the family- What? what? Okay, hold on. Astyanax is not a butterfly, and he's not a fish, because that would just be weird. Ah, uh, here we go. This is Astyanax. Greek for protector of the city or lord of the city. Astyanax was the son of Hector, ruler of Troy. For all of you scratching your heads, Hector comes from the Greek epic Iliad by Homer. The poem states that when Troy fell, the Greeks debated the child Astyanax's fate and feared that the prince would grow up to seek revenge against his conquerors. Therefore, he was cast from the battlements by Odysseus and died. Whoa, that took a really dark turn. However, Renaissance legends express that Astyanax actually survived the defeat of Troy, going on to found settlements and even being the forefather to Charlemagne, king of the Franks around 800 BC. Okay, so now that we know that Astyanax actually comes from Greek and Renaissance mythology, Let's get back to the origin of the game itself. It was developed by ICOM, who also did All Pro Basketball for the NES, and Blaster Master Boy for the Game Boy. Jalico published the title, who would also develop some well-known games themselves, such as the Bases Loaded series for the NES, and Avenging Spirit for the Game Boy. 
Like many games of the late 80s and 90s, this one was born in the arcades. Originally released in 1989 in Japan, the title was known as the Lord of King, which may have originated from the Greek Lord of the City. It would later be released in arcades outside of Japan as The Astian X. A two-player cooperative title, it is an action platformer similar to Golden Axe or Contra and set within a fantasy world of mythical Greek monsters. The sprite of the main character wears blue armor and has blonde hair while wielding an axe. However, the main character's name is actually Roche rather than Astinax. Roche is French for boulder. So we went from fish to butterfly to rock. I'm not sure if the developers were just struggling for a name or something got lost in translation. The player has a power gauge which is diminished and refilled each time an attack is used. This adds a small layer of strategy since you can elect to utilize slow, powerful attacks or quick, less powerful ones. Furthermore, a strong thunder spell may be used to attack all on-screen characters. As previously stated, the player wields an axe which may be upgraded by acquiring power-ups from pillars scattered throughout the level, which can increase the strength of your spell, the amount of your health, or simply increase your point counter. As for defense, a shield may also be attained from the small pillars which will absorb so many attacks before breaking. The enemies are varied with skeletons, bats, praying mantis, and some impressive bosses that are worthy of arcade games of the time. Six varied stages make for an interesting fantasy-based adventure. The story is primarily handled by in-game art portraits that transition the levels, the premise of which is, as the world is overwhelmed with beasts and monsters, the main character Roche is granted a mythical fire axe, which he uses on his adventure to defeat the demon lord Argos. And so it comes full circle, because Argos is the name of Odysseus' loyal dog in the Odyssey, Odysseus being the guy that threw Astyanax over the wall, except Astyanax is not actually in the game. Yeah. What's also weird is that even with the Greek mythology theme, for some reason, the last level takes place in an alien hive. I'm talking like straight out of James Cameron's movie. The last boss is literally a xenomorph. You almost expect to see Ripley peeking out of the shadows during the end battle. I guess they just ran out of ideas. Overall, it is a good arcade platformer that fits the mold of the time. However, when porting the game to the console, the developer had a different idea for its presentation. One year later, in March of 1990, the game would be revamped and released on the NES as Hazanax, or sorry, Astyanax. Most of the elements from the original game were utilized in one fashion or another, yet the NES game took a number of liberties that made it something else entirely. Sprites are much larger, which gives more feeling to every move and attack since the action is so much more pronounced in the center screen. This lends well to the single-player experience that ICOM opted for, rather than the multiplayer of the arcade game. The player character feels much heavier as he moves slowly. Stilted controls make your character more prone to taking damage from much more agile enemies, which can feel cheap in some areas. This can make for a difficult playthrough for some, as actions must be managed closely to avoid sudden damage and even death from simplistic things such as jumps. Thankfully, Astian Axe is actually in this game. Thank goodness, right? I mean, his name is right on the box. Behold the evolution of the character. That's right, he's a kid in school. Hardly the muscle man from the arcade version, but I assume they were going for a different crowd. Then from across the vast distance of time and space, Princess Rosebud calls out for help from Astinax to save the land of Remlia from the evil wizard Blackhorn. Astinax is pulled into the world of Remlia and is greeted by a fairy called Cutie. No, seriously, that's her name. I mean, the developers were seriously lazy on the whole naming thing. Cutie pleads with Astinax to save Remlia and the imprisoned Rosebud. She further explains that saving Rosebud is the only way he can return home. And of course Astinax accepts because what else was he supposed to do? Cutie's magical powers stranded him in a strange world knowing it was a one-way ticket. Not the best icebreaker for asking someone to help save your world. The game feels much more linear from its arcade predecessor but still has that fantastic fantasy feeling. 
The various enemies are strange and eerie, like this guy and this one, or ah, this guy. Come on, man, get some clear eyes or something. That looks infected. Graphics and backgrounds are actually nice to look at and represent the world of Remelia well. And while the bosses are not as grandiose as Lord of King, they still invoke dread and excitement when they appear on the screen. Not to mention the music can really amp you up while you play. The theme for the first level is definitely the most memorable for anyone that's played the game. The power gauge was carried over from Lord of King, and you still collect power-ups from pillars, except the power-ups now work as a new mechanic that actually changes Astyanax's weapon from an axe, to a spear, to a sword. This has a light RPG element to it. Each weapon has its own stats, such as damage and how much of your magic bar is consumed when you cast a spell. Speaking of spells, rather than just one, you now have three. Blind freezes enemies. Blast causes area damage within a small range around Astinax, and Bolt causes damage to any on-screen enemy. Obviously, when translating a game from arcade to console, developers can struggle with replicating sound, controls, and graphics. However, ICOM made up for the translation with a completely new story, levels, and abilities. The story starts out really cheesy, but gets better as time goes on. The console has 11 stages in comparison to the Arcade 6, and as previously stated, not bad to look at. In 2014, the original publisher Jalco declared bankruptcy and sold off its license. Whether Astyanax is among them is unknown. As for the original developer, ICOM, they have since closed shop. We can only hope that one day this game finds its way to a virtual console, or else a competent developer that can give it a good remake. I'm Retro Mackies, and thanks so much for watching Game Bites. If you like this video, please be sure to hit that like button, which helps us to bring you more great videos. Also, be sure to subscribe and follow on Twitter to keep up with news for upcoming videos. Until next time, God bless, take care, and this has been a Bite of Gaming.